So last week we started uh, a maybe a spiritual checkup or a, a, a spiritual wellness visit, if you would, on our spiritual lives. And we said a healthy church member is, and we're going to look at a few things. Last week we said a healthy church member is an expositional listener, meaning very simply that we are listening to the preaching and the teaching from the Word of God to hear God and to hear His Word. Now, the way that God has set it up, we hear it through the mouth of a man, but if we could cut out the middle man, what are we really looking to hear? We're looking to hear not Pastor Drew, not Brother Kurt, not someone else getting up to read and teach and preach. We're looking to hear from God. We're looking to hear from his word. So a healthy church member is an expositional listener. An expositional listening is simply listening for the meaning of a passage of scripture and then accepting that meaning as the main idea that is to be applied to my life as a Christian, both privately and corporately. So we looked at a few benefits of expositional listening. Listening, what are the benefits of listening for the word of God and listening for God to speak to me through his word? Number one, it creates a hunger for God's word. The only way that you really kind of grow in your excitement or enthusiasm for anything is to just surround yourself with that. Uh, I was talking to grandma this morning and uh, I said, well, the snow's coming down. It's starting to look like winter. And she said, it is, but I don't mind it. And I said, I don't either because it means that a different season is changing. And for me as an outdoorsman, there's really, I don't have an off season. I really enjoy hunting season and I enjoy that part. But then when deer season's over, then the Generally, the lakes are covered with ice, and I can get out and go ice fishing. And I love ice fishing season. And then when that's done, then uh, the, the snow melts, and then uh, it becomes open water season again. And there's always something to do. And I was telling her, every season that we get into, whether it's ice fishing season, hunting season, uh, open water season, I always think, well, open water season, that's, that's my favorite. That's my favorite thing. Out of all the outdoors, I really like fishing in a boat. But then when hunting season comes around, I think, oh man, I, I think this is my favorite. I really like hunting. I, I love getting out on October 1st with the bow in my hand. But then ice fishing season comes around and you get the auger packed up and, and uh, you get everything all set and man, I love ice fishing. Why, well, the reason I get so fired up about those different seasons is that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm thinking about. That's the gear that I'm preparing. And as I'm Surrounding myself with those things, that's what I get excited about. And then you say, well, I don't really know how I get excited about God and his word. Try reading his word. Surround yourself with it. Go to church and you will become more and more excited about God and his word when you surround yourself with God and his word. So one of the benefits of expositional listening is that it gives me a hunger for God's word. It helps me focus on God's will. My agenda is pushed to the side and God's will becomes the main focus. It, it uh, protects my life from corruption. How do I keep from the devil and the world infiltrating my mind? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Encur it encourages the pastor. I love preaching to all types of crowds, all ages. Uh, sometimes I even preach to air when I'm maybe going over reading a passage of scripture, especially when there's different names that I struggle with and I'll just read it aloud like I'm preaching it in my office. Uh, but I enjoy more when I'm preaching to a crowd of people who are engaged. If everyone's just on their phone, looking out the window, it, uh, it's not very encouraging. You're thinking, man, am I missing the mark here? What, what's going on? So listening to God and his word through the preacher, it encourages the pastor and it strengthens the unity of the gathered body. How do I make expositional listening a habit? How do I come and sit down in church, even if, let's say, I did something to you or Brother Kurt did something to you this week that just irked you? You know, maybe uh, uh, Kurt uh, took the last piece of pie at Thanksgiving and uh, you're just, man, uh, what a bum. I'm not going to come to Sunday school because I'm not going to watch that pie thief, uh, you know, <laughs> teach me through his word. How can you push all that aside? In a more serious note, how can my brothers and my parents and my grandparents sit and listen to me? They, you know, they know all my, well, you all, I'm pretty, pretty much an open book. You all know where I'm at, right? So how can you sit and listen? How do you make it a habit to listen to God and his word? Number one, we meditate on the passage before the sermon. 
I had a few people ask me this week, uh, well, what are you going to be preaching on uh, this, coming, this coming week? And I know that was because they wanted to read and, and study and, and be prepared to hear. You can read the scripture along with a commentary to get a better understanding. You can talk about the sermon after church. You can listen and act on the sermon throughout the week. Uh, don't just say, well, that was a great message, and then just continue on the same. Maybe apply that message to your life. How do I make it a habit of listening for God and his word through the preaching or the word of God? Ask questions about the text. If you get to something that you don't understand, ask. How do you think I learn? Just because I have all knowledge and wisdom of all things Bible, and I know everything in my vast uh, amount of Bible study in my 29 years on this earth. No. I ask. I look. I study. And lastly, be humble. Don't become a professional sermon listener thinking, oh boy, he missed a point here. Oh, he misspoke. Oh, he split two infinitives and uh, ended 57 uh, sentences and prepositions. Uh, don't become a professional sermon listener. Allow God to speak through his man and to you through his word. So a healthy church member number two this morning is a biblical theologian. A biblical theologian. We're going to look at what is Bible theology, how does it benefit me, and how can I make it a habit? What is Bible theology? That sounds kind of deep, dark, and dry. It's simply the study uh, of the nature of God and religious beliefs. That's it. The study of God and who he is. It's thinking about God and then systematically developing those thoughts through study. That's all it is. It's just thinking about meditating on studying God in an organized way so that we can understand God, his word, his truths, and his principles. Our first and most basic calling as a Christian, as a believer, is to, uh, is to know God. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek, seek his face continually. Amos chapter 5, verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Psalm 27, verse 8, When thou saidst, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. We're supposed to know God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, In the New Testament, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto him. His death. We ought to know God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18, you're there. The Apostle Peter ends his letter with this thought, but grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We ought to know God. Ignorance of God, both of his ways and our communication with him, lies at the root of the church's weakness today. You say, well, I know God. I know God. This message is not for me. I'm a biblical theologian. I know God. But yet, so many believers can't answer basic Bible questions about God. If I said, I need you to give me one verse in the next five minutes, Proving that God is a trinity, or proving that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, or proving that there is that Jesus was virgin born. Some of you would think, oh my goodness. Hey Google, verses about Jesus Christ being the only <laughs> We say we know God, but how much do we really know about God? You say, well, I know God. But when we call for a corporate prayer, we're either very uncomfortable praying or it's, it's made kind of obvious, we kind of caught off guard, and you can tell that, not that someone ought to be flowery when they pray or have, you know, perfect verbiage, but you can tell, I don't, I don't know if that person prays a whole lot, because it, it seemed kind of rough and choppy. So if we don't know much about God, and we're not very comfortable talking to him, if there was someone in the community say, oh, I know that person, oh, what do you know about him? Oh, I don't know anything about him. You ever talk to him? Oh, no, I never talked to him. That's called a stranger. But yet we say, oh, I know God. Well, what do you know about him? Not a whole lot. You ever talk to him? Not really. Does he ever talk to you? Eh. 
The state of this affair reveals how too many Christians have neglected their first and highest calling to know God. Every Christian is to be a theologian. The Apostle Paul charged Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, studying the word of God, takes work. It takes sweat. That needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does it mean to be a theologian? Why do I need to study God's word? Number one, to be a theologian is to know God himself. Well, how do I know God? Through his word. The Bible is the revelation of God. The Bible is the revelation of God. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How do we know about God? Well, from, you know, Dr. Big Bottom, what we saw in Sunday school, Dr. Curtis Q. Rogers, apparently. He's going to be the one who teaches us about God. Probably not. Where are we going to learn about who God is? You're not going to learn him completely from me, because there's a whole lot about God that I don't know, that I don't understand. Right here from the revelation that he gave us about himself. A Christian who wants to know God is a Christian who first wants to know what God says about himself. We should never begin a sentence, well, I like to think of God as... A healthy Christian is committed to what the Bible says about God because the Bible is where God tells us about himself. So what is a biblical theologian? In number one, it is to know God himself, number two, to be a theologian is to know the entire Bible. You say, well, I don't know the, th I don't know the entire Bible. Good. Join the club. I founded it. Uh, the I don't know the entire Bible club. A healthy church member gives himself to understanding the unity and the progression of the Bible as a whole. You could ask a pastor who's been pastoring for 40 or 50 years, ask Pastor Williams, Pastor, do you know the whole Bible? He would tell you, he probably is further behind than we thought he was when he started. Uh, the more I've, I have given uh, a lot of time, more time than I ever had before, this year than last year, the year before that, to studying God's word. And I was literally thinking this morning as I was highlighting out the message and thinking I have so much work to do. I know less today than I knew yesterday. And uh, there's just so much. We could study a lifetime and not even scratch the surface of God's word because it's alive, it's powerful, it's his word. But we ought to not memorize the entire Bible or have it just stuffed in there for knowledge's sake, but understand when I say you know the entire Bible, to understand that it's, it's all connected together. It's not 66 individual books. It's not the old law and the New Testament. It all is in unity and in unison telling us the same thing. You can pull out a few isolated verses and take them out of context and you can make the Bible say just about whatever you want. We did that yesterday, kind of, or last Sunday, as a little bit of an example. So it's important that we not just pull out isolated passages or say, oh, I like this. Ooh, I don't like this. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to read that. I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. Uh, like uh, those of you who watch Hogan Heroes, like Hogan's Heroes, like Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. I, don't, I, never, I didn't see that, right? That's buffet Christianity. That's saying, oh, I like this. Ooh, I love me some mashed potatoes. Ooh, clams. Ah, ah. I don't like that. I don't like having to go to all the services. We're going to leave those there. Oh, here we go. Prayer. I can pray. I like that. Oh, confrontational soul winning. I don't want to have to share the gospel. I'm going to leave that deviled egg alone. Let's move down and see what else is there. Oh, God's grace. I'll take a slice of pie. All right. That's not how it works. That's buffet Christianity. When we look at the Bible as one awesome story of God redeeming for himself a people for his own glory, we see it in that story a redeeming God, a creating God, a holy God, a faithful God, a loving God, a sovereign God who makes and keeps promises to his people from Adam all the way to the consummation of the world and its end. That is what it is to be a biblical theologian, to know God and to know the entire Bible together. So how does it benefit me? Why should I convince me why I should study God's word? Number one, it grows my reverence for God. The more that I learn about God, the more I want to learn about God. 
The more that I learn about God, the more I realize who he is and what he's done for me, what he's saved me from, what he's bringing me to, the more I want to learn about him. The more I understand scripture, the more I realize that God truly is working all the time, all things for my good, beginning with the promise that he made. Flip back to Genesis, flip to Genesis, beginning all the way back to Eve in the garden. God is working all things for my good. And this helps grow my reverence, my respect, my awe for who he is. Why should I be a biblical theologian? Why should I study the word of God? Because it helps me respect who he is. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Eve's taken the fruit, gave it to her husband. They hid. God said, hey, Adam, where are you? They find out that they've sinned. They took the fruit, they ate of the tree that they weren't supposed to eat of. Eve, Adam blamed the woman. The woman blamed the serpent. God immediately begins creating redemption's plan. God is holy, he's just, and he laid out what the consequence of the disobedience was going to be. But then immediately, what did he begin to do? He just began to just beat them over the head. I can't believe I gave you all this. I gave you all these good things. I gave you all these trees. I gave you the woman. I gave you all this, all these animals, all my creation. And, and he just began to browbeat them for being so dumb for messing up. No, he immediately put into effect Redemption's plan. Chapter 3, verse 15 of Genesis. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He's talking to Satan, the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed. Her seed there is referring to Jesus Christ. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here in Genesis chapter 3, third chapter of the word of God, God is putting into place that Jesus Christ is going to come and redeem us back to himself. And when I understand that, when I understand as I study his word that the word of God is redemption story from start to finish, that gives me awe and respect for who he is. When I see that God immediately promised a way for me to be reconciled back to him, I understand that he always has been, is, and always will be that same creating, holy, faithful, loving, and sovereign God. Knowing this, how can I be angry with him? How could I question him? How could I become to a place where I'm, I think ill of him? I can't stand God. Get out of my life, God. You're never going to outrun him. You're never going to get away from him. But sometimes we feel as such. But when, when I study God's word, it helps me understand who he is and it helps grow that reverence and respect for God. Why be a biblical theologian? Number two, it helps me overcome my wrong ideas. Remember as a kid, sometimes uh, we would... Tell dad would be like, why, why did you do this? We'd be in a, a pickle or a situation. And uh, we'd say, well, I thought. He'd say, stop you right there. There's the problem. It, you we thought. It's that stinking thinking. It'll get you in trouble all the time. Sometimes I do some stinking thinking and I cook up some, some just ideas that don't fit God's word. But as I study the word of God, it helps overcome my wrong ideas. We all encounter biblical verses and teaching that we don't like. That we don't that either challenge us or confuse us. Sometimes we refuse to accept that teaching because of sin in our own life. Sometimes we avoid verses because it doesn't seem easy or fun or it challenges an area of our in our life as sin. But when we give ourselves to total Bible study, we will be more readily convicted of our wrong ideas, and we will see how God has really spoken the same message. From beginning to end, God isn't picking on us. He's not a boogeyman thinking, all right, I'm going to cook up something just to make Dave Lundeen have a miserable life. God has been the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's been preaching the same message forever. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sun-dry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. God hasn't changed. He's not making it harder on us. He's not. God has always spoken the same truth and it's always been to help us live a better life, to keep us from things that would ruin our lives. And we will also remember as we study his word that one day we all are going to bow. We're saying, why be a biblical theologian? 
is so that it helps me overcome my wrong ideas, my wrong thoughts, my wrong philosophies about God and his word. When we study the word of God, we see over and over and over again that God is bringing everyone to himself. He's bringing the entire universe and all of creation to a climax and a conclusion where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. When we understand that God is bringing the world to a conclusion that is going to be man, woman, child, saved or unsaved, we all are going to recognize that Jesus is the truth. And we have to understand that, and it helps us, it reminds us of that when we study his word. Number three, why be a biblical theologian? The benefits of it. It guards the church against doctrinal controversy. History is filled with examples of churches uh, and controversy rising again uh, against each other in the congregation. Understanding the entire Bible helps us to be able to withstand and resolve those controversies that arise. This is one of the main reasons why God gave us his word. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Why be a biblical theologian? To protect us from bickering and fussing, for lack of better words, against each other over the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for, and samples, and they are written for our admonition. We have the ability to look back in the Old Testament and see the children of Israel. And we get to see over and over and over again, the children of Israel. God provides for them in a miraculous way. And then they start complaining and whining, and then God does something else to bring them back where they need to be. God corrects them, they get their hearts right, and then they're doing good for a time. And then they venture off over here, and then God has to bring them back. And, over, and we, we were given those things as an example, to learn from those things and say, hey, here's where, and then in the New Testament, we are given examples in Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, how the churches were uh, coming up, uh, coming head to head with some different, different uh, disputations and different things. And the Apostle Paul said, hey, these were gi given to us for example, so that we can learn and so that we don't have those same controversies, so that we can be united and working together for the gospel. Why be a biblical theologian? Number four, it's necessary for filling the Great Commission. Flip over to Matthew 28. You're there in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28, this is a very common passage, quoted often. In fact, this verse here was uh, given in the, in the Sunday school lesson. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Part of the Great Commission, of course, is sharing the gospel. That's the first step, is to go and to win. But then we're supposed to teach teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, what, what did Jesus teach us? What did he command us? Right here, his word. You cannot teach something that you first don't know yourself. I've seen people try, but it doesn't work very well. You have to know something first to be able to teach it. I could not teach you how to rebuild a transmission because I have never done that and I have no idea how to do it. So if you said, hey, how do you rebuild a tranny? So I don't know. If you find out, let me know. Uh, you have to know something in order to teach it. So we cannot fully fulfill the Great Commission if we don't first know the Word of God and then are able to teach it to those who we win and baptize. If we are going to teach all that Christ commanded us, we first must know all that Christ commanded us. Number five, and lastly, why be a biblical theologian? Why study? I realize this is a lot. 
If you want, you can grab notes from me. I'll gladly print them out for you. You can look over them, but we're, uh, we're going to press on. It deepens our understanding of the gospel. It deepens our understanding of the gospel. Jesus and the apostles did not need the New Testament to share the word of God. In fact, it, the New Testament was not fully recognized the full canon until the early 300s, three, over 300 years before the New Testament was fully written and compiled. So how was Jesus able to bring people to himself? Well, I, I can see how Jesus could bring people to himself. He literally was salvation in flesh and blood. But how were the apostles able to do that? I don't know how. How would I lead someone to Christ? All the, all the tr gospel tracks through the Romans Road. They didn't have the Romans Road yet. Uh, the Romans Road was just a place they traveled on. They didn't, so how did they bring people to Christ? They relied on Old Testament scripture. So we ought to know the word of God to be able to more fully understand the gospel. Turn to, we have, we have time. Uh, Luke chapter 24. This is probably the passage of scripture that spoke to me the most in this entire study on why I ought to be a Bible theologian. It's so that I can understand the gospel to the fullest, so that as I'm sharing the salvation message, there is never any question or any disputation or anything that I'm not able to fully answer with Scripture to help someone have the best opportunity to trust Christ. It's not my job to save anyone, but it's my job to make it available. And, and if but sometimes we do a poor job of that because we don't have an understanding of the Word of God. And someone says, well, what about this? They teach this at the Catholic Church, or they teach this, or, or someone told me this, and you think, that's a pretty good question. I have no idea. But if we're students of the Word of God and we have a full grasp of the Gospel, we're able to debunk all the lies of Satan and false teachers and able to give someone the greatest opportunity to understand the Gospel. Luke chapter 24, verse 27, And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. Skip down to verse 44. <coughs> and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened, opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So here's a promise. Not only ought we to read and study not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, God's going to open our mind of understanding. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us and give us understanding to say, how are you able to read and study the Word of God and come up with all these things? How do you get all that out of one little verse? I don't know. The Holy Spirit reveals he's the one who teaches. You have the same God living inside of you that I do inside of me, and he'll teach you just as well as he'll teach me. A biblical theologian masters the unity of the Old and New Testament scripture and sees Christ and the gospel throughout. The Old Testament simply is just an arrow that's pointing to the cross, pointing backwards. The New Testament is simply just an arrow pointing to the cross. It was just pointing forward. The both given in different points in history, but both pointing to the very instance in history of Jesus Christ. So, how do I become a biblical theologian? Here's the how-to. Here's the how to make it a habit in very fiercely practical way. Number one, read a good book on theology. And uh, here's a couple that I would suggest as far as um, men who I know as far as their commentaries, uh, wouldn't lead you astray. Uh, John Phillips has a good um, commentary on all scripture. And this is just um, maybe commentary suggestions as far as studying out the word either thematically or um, expository. expository. Um, J. Vernon McGee is another pretty safe commentary. Uh, Matthew Henry. And then um, if you have a Schofield Bible, if you want to do just the most basic, say I, I, having the Word of God open and then another book open, that seems kind of already just kind of overwhelms my mind. 
a Schofield reference Bible with the center uh, column that just has, how many of you have a Bible like that where it has like each word or maybe a verse will have A, B, C, and then you look in the center and it'll, it'll give you, if you were just to kind of read those and study, that would just be an incredible, that opens up your mind and, and it'll take you different places. Like when I was preaching out of 1 Samuel, um, I read out of this Bible because it doesn't have any commentary, it doesn't have any notes, simply for the fact that I don't want to be distracted. Uh, but then when I am looking to maybe dig deeper, once I get a general idea of the passage, then I'll open up my Schofield Bible and I'll study through that. Then I'll grab a couple other commentaries and even look deeper just to get a couple different angles on the same passage. Those are a couple that I would suggest, and I just said this, ask someone that you trust spiritually before choosing books on theology and doctrine. I was recently reading a book and studying, and there's, there was a couple little words in there um, that I just thought, ooh, wow, this was a really, really biblical book. I'm a couple hundred pages in, but on salvation, uh, they were talking about perseverance of the saints, which would have been, obviously, um, false for salvation. So, I'm careful what I recommend to people to study and read, and obviously uh, use a grain of salt. As I mentioned yes, uh, last week, every commentary is just that. It's another man's comments on the Word of God, and the, the Bible is always right. And man, if, if, if there's ever a conflict between man and the Bible, man's right or wrong 100% of the time. The Bible is right 100% of the time, all right? Number two, study Scripture thematically, meaning by themes. So, we ought to spend most of our time just reading passages of Scripture. Uh, that keeps us from taking verses out of context. When you start studying either themes or names of God or maybe studying grace, that's where you're going to come up with some of those, well, that doesn't really make sense, or these two verses seem to contra contradict themselves. God is a spirit. Those that, must, that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. A couple of verses later, no man has seen the face of God at any time. God's a spirit. How does he have a face? How does he have hands? How does he have a heart? And so be careful when studying themes through the Bible, because that's where you can get caught up uh, and confused. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, ask. But study themes, and that will pique your interest, and it'll help you learn leaps and bounds. Number three, read the New Testament with the Old Testament in mind. Ask yourself these questions as you're reading the New Testament. How is this verse in Matthew fulfilling something that was prophesied in the Old Testament? Ask yourself, how is this New Testament idea similar or different from Old Testament teaching? In what way does this New Testament passage either clarify or unveil or amplify something that's found in the Old Testament? Number four, the same thing is true. Study the Old Testament with the New Testament in mind. Ask yourself, where does this passage in the Old Testament fit in the, in the timeline of history? I bought, if, if you poke your head in my office, you'll see my grandpa's massive buck behind my desk. And then on the wall right here, you'll see a huge circular timeline with all kinds of different colors. That is a timeline of many of the main men and different kingdoms and different things in the Bible. I think that chart was like 50 bucks. If you really want to kind of put timelines in perspective of where people fall in history, grab uh, one of those and, and roll it out. They make smaller ones. You don't have to get like the 10 footer, but they have smaller ones. It's a, an incredible study just to kind of place where people are at, realizing that we are closer currently from the time of King David and King Saul than King Saul was uh, from creation. And just different things like that, you realize that more time has lapsed uh, from creation to Saul than from Saul to us, or that it, you just get to see all kinds of different things. Um, how does this Old Testament passage continue or discontinue in the New Testament? Which New Testament passage helps me understand these questions that I have in the, in the Old Testament? Number five, study books of prophecy in the Old Testament. That's all I have for that. Number six, know and agree and to support our statement of faith here at church. This is just a very practical one. Know what our statement of faith is here at church. And if you don't know what it is, a lot of it's stated in our Constitution under statement of faith. Read our church Constitution. Some of you have joined our church and you've never read our Constitution or our statement of faith. You don't know what we, what we believe. There goes my notes. 
Some of you voted for me as pastor and you've never read my statement of faith. You don't know what I believe. Uh, you just took a blind stab. Well, I hope this guy... <laughs> lastly, seek doctrinal unity and avoid disputes. Pastor Williams said this, and I love it. Stand firm on doctrine. Be flexible on preferences. Stand firm on doctrine. Be flexible on preferences. There are some things in a spiritual manner that are worth fighting for. The gospel of Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith, is something that's worth arguing about and worth fighting for. The word of God. That's something worth fighting for. We're not looking to change it. We're not looking to bring in new versions. It's worth fighting for. Other things, whether we have one special or two or none, or whether we have whatever, fellowship once a month or once a quarter, who cares? It's not a big deal. We can do whatever. But those things, those are important. Those are things that are not going to change. Don't look to be... Stand firm on doctrine. Look for unity in doctrine and avoid disputes. Here's a couple of good verses on that. Here, there's some th um, Philippians chapter 1, verse, 20, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Here's a couple of verses that charge us not to start arguing and fussing. If you start studying the Old Testament and then you come and say, well, I think Jesus Christ is coming back, I'm just going to tune you out right away because you don't know when he's coming back. Or if you say, well, there's a lot of things about prophecy or about God that we just don't fully understand. Well, could God create a rock that he couldn't lift? He, he can do all things. That means he could create a rock that he couldn't lift. But then if he couldn't lift the rock, then he could do, couldn't do something. And now he's not all-powerful. Those are just, here's, here's a verse on that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself to prove unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Titus chapter 3, verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A healthy church member is a biblical theologian. A healthy church member is, number one, an expositional listener. When you're listening to teaching and preaching from the Word of God, you're not listening for a fancy illustration. You're not listening for Dr. Big Bottom's spin on whatever he thinks about the word of God, you're listening for him to speak to you. And a healthy church member is a biblical theologian. We ought to study God's word. We ought to be students of the word that we could understand him, know him, and rightly divide the word of truth for ourselves, for our children, for the generations to come, and for the lost so that they may understand the gospel.